So today we have the chance to <clears throat> dive into the Four Noble Truths, which are appropriately famous in the world of Buddhist doctrine. They are uh, taken to be a teaching that is unique to the Buddhas. There are those very few supremely enlightened ones. Very, very few people have attained complete awakening and can teach it and can offer us the uh, meaningful, usable, uh, powerful means of learning and walking the path that lead to our own awakening. Before we move into the Four Noble Truths themselves, it's important to talk about the general structure of them. The Four Noble Truths uh, are the most useful version of a certain principle, which we might translate as specific conditionality. It's specifically conditional. It's conditional in a certain way. So this, this point of specific conditionality, this is the critical aspect of enlightenment. With this, or there being this, there is that. When this arises, that arises. There not being this, there is not that. When this ceases, that ceases. The, the brilliance of this teaching is very difficult to express. And so I would recommend that you simply take the next, you know, few months, few years, few decades, few lifetimes, few aeons, reflecting upon these sentences, these few phrases. Uh, this is the core. We're starting here when we get into the depths of Buddhist doctrine. The main point is that in very specific ways, cause and effect takes place. And if you see that, then you see everything you need to see. If you can see that, then you will attain enlightenment, liberation from suffering, and the wisdom needed to enact your compassion for all beings. It's an incredible claim, and <clears throat> uh, it's really up to you to get to a point of sufficient desperation that you will wring the water out of this rock of these sentences and fulfill your thirst, ending your thirst, quenching your thirst forever. As you begin to actually contemplate these phrases and learn them, you get to a point when you, you, you have to accept that the Buddha must have been enlightened because no one could be that smart. There's no way without enlightenment you could possibly have given such a teaching. Because again, he came up with this. We, we now say, oh yeah, of course, cause and effect. It's easy to say it when people have been saying it for thousands of years, especially when you don't hold yourself accountable to actually understanding it. You're just repeating what somebody said. But to actually come up with it and be right about this, and not only to be right, but to say something which is intuitive to us, but leads us beyond our intuition, leads us beyond birth and death, leads us beyond ourselves and the world. This is incredible. This talk is about suffering. This talk is about your real problems, your actual issues, the problems that you really have with other people, the problems in the world, the problems in your own heart. That is what this is about. And 
the first noble truth points at that. It points at the question of, we might call it suffering or problems. Uh, how it is that you are not satisfied. You're not in a good place. That is what the first noble truth points at. And the four noble truths are the way that this uh, description of conditionality or causality is applied to the one real thing that you actually care about, which is how it is that you suffer. How it is that suffering arises in the world. That's the only thing that people care about. <laughs> so we should look into that directly. That is the thing that you're concerned about. And what is this, this, this conditionality? Well, it is, <clears throat> we have this, this claim made that there is suffering. There are problems. You're not satisfied. That is the claim of the first noble truth. And uh, people who haven't looked into that don't have a way to enter into the teaching of the Buddhas. So this is where the whole thing begins. Now, it isn't that there's only bad everywhere. It isn't that there's only suffering and we're only stupid. Not at all. On the contrary, we are a mix of wisdom and ignorance, of compassion and selfishness. And, the, and what happens as we practice and we start to see the details of specific conditionality is we begin to disentangle various causes from various, various effects that we can start to behave in wiser ways that in fact resolve suffering rather than create it. So as we enter into this, we start to come with any, we, we're willing to do anything to avoid the first noble truth. And anything means, of course, anything includes, we are willing to create the first noble truth. We're willing to produce suffering in order to avoid facing it. And in fact, if you want a, a simple summary of human history, it goes like this. We create suffering in order to avoid it. So the second noble truth is, is cause, that there is a cause, a samudaya, of suffering, of the first noble truth. Trishna is thirst, or tanha, and that means uh, it, both the sense of craving, but also there's an aversion uh, to what we don't like, and, and, a, and a held ignorance regarding things that we neither like nor don't like. Uh, so we are actively ignorant unless we have to know about it, and then if we know about something we like, then we want it and we try to get it. If it's something that we know we don't like, then we try to get rid of it and make sure it never comes back. Uh, this craving, this delight in this and hatred of that is our strategy for overcoming suffering, despite the fact that it is the cause of suffering. And critically, we move on then to the third noble truth, nirod or cessation. Very few people believe that there could be the third noble truth. Very few people buy that. It, uh, the claim is made. The Buddha makes the claim. Lots of people through history make the claim that there could really be the cessation of suffering. That there is the unconditioned as an escape from the conditioned. But you will note that it's quite logical. It's quite reasonable if you accept this doctrine of specific conditionality and you accept that craving is the basis of suffering. If you accept all of that, well then, there's only one more thing you have to see in order to acknowledge that there must be an end of suffering. That is that you acknowledge that craving is impermanent. That craving doesn't exist on its own. Craving doesn't just exist always, everywhere, under all circumstances, no matter what. 
that craving is the kind of thing that comes and goes. And all of us know that craving is the kind of thing that comes and goes. We have that experience directly. And it turns out that because of that, if, if, if we acknowledge all of these points, then we know that craving could come to cessation. Cra craving could end. And if craving ends, then suffering has to end because suffering is based in specific conditionality. And then there's a way to bring that craving to an end. There is an actual way to do it, and that way is the fourth noble truth, which we're not going to get into in any detail right now, other than to say that there's causality there. So, there's ca so with the cessation of this, the cessation of craving, there's the cessation of, of suffering, then there's a way to do that. You can actually pull that off. So due to walking this path, there is, nirvana, there is the realization of nirvana. There is the cessation of suffering. It's amazing. 